Good evening, DEF CON. How many, of you, how many of you are here for your first DEF CON? Raise your hand. Me too. Isn't this awesome? Don't make it your last. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Shear, most famously known for the name you saw when you were looking in the program for Bruce Schneier. Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, my name is Michael Shear, the Prez 98. I'm going to th give a talk called uh, Hacking Iraq. This is what I'm going to talk about. Introduction. I've got some disclaimers that I got to put out for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. I'm going to talk about why the Navy is in Iraq. I'm going to talk about the a uh, little bit about the communications infrastructure in Iraq, and then we'll talk about IEDs and a little bit about the future. First of all, this is stuff I have to talk about just to let you know. I'm active duty uh, military, uh, and there's some limitations on what I can say. So, uh, how many of you are? Active duty military, former military, um, yeah, quite a bit of you. You know what operational security is. Information that is not necessarily classified, but information that if you put a lot of it together can reveal classified information. That's a limitation of my talk because I can't tell you so much that, uh, that somebody can go hurt my so fellow soldiers serving in Iraq. So there's a limit on what I can tell you. It's a challenge because I have to decide, is it worth me getting up here to tell you so that 50 minutes from now, can you walk out of this talk and say, wow, that was really cool, but some insurgent in Iraq can download this talk off the internet and say, well, that was 50 minutes, that 50 minutes was a waste of my time. So that's, that's a challenge for me to be up here, and I hope you appreciate that. This presentation is unclassified. If you came here expecting classified information, that's kind of silly if you thought I was going to reveal something, and I'm not going to. Uh, nothing in this presentation is classified, nothing's for official use only, and nothing violates the Privacy Act. There's a whole bunch of DOD directives that say I couldn't work on this presentation while I was at work, so I didn't. There's a couple other presentations that say if the DOD released information, like if they had a press conference, I can use that information. Isn't that nice of them? All the, all the uh, information on my slides, the pictures were either obtained like I took the picture or they were obtained using unclassified search terms or from DOD press conferences. So there's not any information here that, that isn't already out there. By the way, I'm off duty right now. I'm not here as a representative of the U.S. Navy or the United States government. And finally, I don't care if you're for or against the war. That doesn't matter to me. This talk is not about the war per se. This talk is about uh, improvised explosive devices. Okay, get all that out of the way. My background, I'm an active duty uh, U.S. Navy lieutenant. I'm actually getting out of the military in, uh, in February, so I'm almost done. I'm an EA6B electronic communications, uh, uh, electronic countermeasures officer, licensed amateur radio operator, and I'm active on the Church of Wi-Fi forums, remote exploit forums, and DEF CON and Netstumber forums, if you're familiar with any of those places. This is what I used to do. This is a picture of the EA-6B Prowler. It's an electronic countermeasures jet that jams enemy radar and communications. So I'm an aviator. I fly for a living. This is the USS Abraham Lincoln. I spent uh, nine months uh, in 2003 doing a, a tour uh, in the Middle East flying off of uh, Abraham Lincoln. This is me in the back of the jet. By the way, if you're ever at an air show and you get to climb in a jet and you see anything that's yellow or black, don't touch it. For example, that, that, uh, that handle above my head, that's the ejection handle. If I pull that handle out about two or three inches, I go through that canopy. No, the canopy doesn't come off. I go through the canopy. This is an EA-6B Prowler going off the front end of uh, an aircraft carrier. It's about zero to 135 miles an hour in about two seconds. It's better than any roller coaster you've been on any, ever, anywhere. And I've done it uh, about 250 times. It's the best thing I've ever done. That's what I used to do. This is what I did for nine months in Iraq. If you're familiar with the video of Saddam Hussein wearing a suit, brown suit, he's got a fedora and he has a shotgun and he fires it off and the crowd's cheering, that's uh, at his Saddam's parade ground. This is where I'm standing uh, uh, here. This is a picture uh, outside of Balad, Iraq, uh, and this is a convoy that is stopped for three hours in 130 degree heat because someone thought they saw an IED on the ground. 
there wasn't anything there, but we, stat we stopped for three hours in 130 degree heat. It was not very fun. This is a picture, uh, capture of an um, improvised explosives device going off. Fortunately, I was not in the ve this vehicle at the time. And I don't have a lot of videos of this stuff, but you can search all over the internet, and most of it's uh, recorded by the insurgents. Okay, I did stop by the pool at the U.S. Embassy once or twice. It's actually very nice. So why is the Navy in Iraq? I'm an aviator. Why am I standing there with an M16 wearing army camouflage and 60 pounds of gear, including armor plates and body armor? Why? Well, first of all, is the threat from improvised explosive devices. The army says, or the military says, that the bleeding cause of injury and death to soldiers in Iraq is improvised explosive devices. Yes, there are snipers. Yes, there are suicide bombers. But IEDs are the number one cause of casualties in Iraq. The numbers vary. 65, 70, 75 percent of casualties are caused by IEDs. Well, what's the second part of that equation? The second part is that the Army asked for help. At the end of the Cold War, the Army basically shed their electronic warfare capability, and they just don't have that capability anymore. This is, you won't be able to read this, but this is a letter uh, written from uh, General Chiarelli, who was in Iraq at the time, to Admiral Mullen, who is the, was the CNO of the Navy, and in set the next month will become the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of the Staff. And this is basically explaining what I said, that the Army needed the Navy to help uh, s with electronic warfare. The last part of the equation is that the, the Navy already had an indigenous electronic warfare capability. People like me who are used to flying, except I didn't think my, indigenous, my electronic warfare capability was going to be deployed to Iraq for nine months. There's another pick, like uh, EA-6B Prowler. It's ugly. The result is JCCS-1, and that's an acronym for Joint Crew Composite Squadron 1. How the, how the military loves the acronym. From the JCCS-1 homepage, here's the mission. Suppression of the RCIED threat. Now, RCIED, I'm going to have to explain all these acronyms to you. Radio-controlled improvised explosive device to coalition forces and reduce casualties through enhanced electronic warfare coordination and J-Crew operations training and readiness. J-Crew, Joint Counter R -E -R -C -I -E -D Electronic Warfare. How do you like that? You know somebody got a reward for writing this. So what does this mean? This means that we are using electronic warfare against IEDs. In other words, we're using RF energy to try to prevent an IED from going off. That's what you can read out of that. Before I talk about the IEDs, um, I had given a version of this talk at ShmooCon in, in March, and a lot of people asked me some questions about the internet in Iraq. So I added a good section, and I found a lot of decent information about the Iraqi communications infrastructure, because it does relate a little bit to my talk. So I want to talk about that a little bit. First of all, we'll talk about the landline network, or perhaps the lack of the landline network in Iraq. Secondly, we'll talk about cell networks. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, internet, the very short history of the internet in Iraq, and satellite-based communications. The landline network in Iraq was heavily damaged following the Gulf War and the Iraq, or the Iraq War in 2003. That's not to say that there was much of a landline network. Even now, there's less than a million out of 27 million people in Iraq that have a physical landline connection, literally copper going to their house. So about one, or about three out of 100 homes actually have a landline going to their home. And of those, they estimate less than 50% of the time they actually work. The estimated cost to rebuild the landline network just back to its current state before the Gulf War was over a billion dollars. So the answer is, do we want to spend a billion dollars rebuilding a very poor landline network, or do we want to spend less than that and install cellular networks that more people have access to? And of course, that was the answer. 
Here's an example. This telephone main lines per 100 people. A main line is a connection from your home to the, to the uh, telephone network. So you can see that it peaked in 1990 with almost four per 100. Since then, uh, it's, it's stabilized to about three per 100. So still, not very much. Uh, to, to compare, uh, industrialized nations are typically in the 60 to 70 and above range, for, like for example, the United States. Cell networks. Cell networks in large scale began introduction in Iraq uh, after, the begin after the war began in 2003, after, the, after casualties, or after the mission was accomplished. That's, I, I shouldn't have said that. <clears throat> I'm not criticizing the president, honestly. Um, Iraqi cell phone uh, providers, there are five or six. The first two in bold, Arachna and Asia Cell, are the two major providers, but there are additional ones. The networks are GSM 900, and they're, although they are installing, uh, they are upgrading uh, probably this year and next year. By 2004, there were 1.4 million subscribers, and as of last year, over 7 million. So 7 million people in Iraq have cell phones. Less than a million actually have a phone in their house, and there's 27 million people in Iraq. So you know, one out of every three or four people has a cell phone. Everybody's got a cell phone. This is a coverage map of uh, Arachna, which is actually the major cell phone provider. It doesn't necessarily look like a lot to you, but if you know the population density of Iraq, you know where the cities are located, this actually covers a large portion of Iraq. Uh, the large population area in and around Baghdad, and then the, the spots in the south cover the major cities, as well as Basra down there, just north of Kuwait. This is an Asia cell coverage map, which covers part, uh, mostly the eastern half of the country, as well as mo most of uh, the northern Iraq, which is commonly referred to as Kurdistan or the Kurdish area of Iraq. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, pr the history of the internet uh, in Iraq. Prior to 1999, it's estimated that perhaps 10,000 people had dial-up access to the internet. 10,000 out of 20-some million. You can also imagine that most of these people are either Ba'athists, which were Saddam Hussein's party, loyalists, or the very wealthy. So we're talking about a very small percentage of the people having dial-up access, so out of the very few people that actually have uh, tel telephones. And of course, that internet was heavily censored so that these people couldn't access anything outside of, you know, what or whatever Iraq thought, whatever Saddam Hussein thought was appropriate. Between uh, 1999 and 2003, there was a bit of liberal liberalization in the internet policy. Uh, perhaps 75 internet cafes operating throughout Baghdad and Iraq. Perhaps 25,000 users. And again, heavily censored so that these people couldn't really get anything outside of what, of what the Ba'athist party wanted them to see. Since the war began, now over 100,000 users, estimated 500% uh, increase in users over the next five years. You can see the graph here. It's going to be explosive as, uh, as the landline network starts to rebuild. Uh, also, a lot of that internet is satellite-based, which is... If you see a home in Iraq, it's, very, it's generally made of, of, of dirt. They have maybe one or two rooms. They may or may not have electricity. Well, they probably have electricity for their satellite dish. Everyone in Iraq has a satellite dish. Yorick Link is the uh, primary provider of internet in Iraq. It, it, it was an, it originally part of the Ministry of Information, so it's, it's kind of a pseudo-state entity. Uh, but there are other providers, and there's a lot of private companies that do provide satellite access to Iraq, and that is where most of the access is coming from. For that's where the where you'd get broadband really if you wanted uh, access in Iraq. Provided primarily by Middle Eastern and uh, European companies. Very interesting. Every, almost every country in the world has their own domain except Iraq. Dot IQ domain was owned by a company called Infocom, run by a gentleman in Texas, until, until 2005. So Iraq had no home on the internet. By 2005, this domain, the gentleman in Texas, I won't go into the backstory, but he had some problems with the law, and uh, the domain was finally assigned to Iraq. However, there's perhaps 500 sites on the internet. If you do a Google search for site.iq, 
you see perhaps 500 sites on the internet that actually are under the, the IQ domain. And in fact, most government sites in Iraq are still using .com, .org, .net sites that, or, you know, just generic sites like that. Very few, perhaps one or two ministries in the Iraqi government are actually using the .iq domain. There's also uh, a smattering of uh, satellite-based communications for both internet and uh, uh, telephone, uh, Iridium, Thuraya, InterSputnik, I wonder who that is, Intelsat. Gives you an idea of what's available. Uh, so there is pretty good coverage in, the, in, in all of the Middle East for satellite-based communications. I want to spend the majority of my talk talking about improvised explosive devices and a couple of things. First of all, what makes up an improvised explosive device? And then secondly, how can we start to get rid of these things? I'm, we're not going to eliminate them. It's like, it's like uh, risk. You can't eliminate risk. You manage risk. Well, you manage the IED problem. What makes up an improvised explosive device? Well, it can be complicated, but really it comes down to three basic components the initiator, the detonator, and the explosive charge. The initiator is a device, well, let me go back into the initiators. There are four, ty four basic types of initiators. There's the command wire. This is the Wiley e. Coyote wire that goes from the device all the way, winds to the to Wiley e. Coyote, holding the, pushing the button or pressing the plunger down, sending the signal through the wire to the bomb to go off. That's a command wire. The second type is victim operated. Victim operated is a booby trap, perhaps a pressure wire or a trip wire. In other words, something that the victim, the intended person who, who the device is intended for, is actually tripping some sort of signal or physical device to set off. A mine is a victim operated device. Third would be vehicle born. Vehicle born is either a suicide bomber or perhaps just a car bomb that maybe perhaps no one is actually driving, but a car bomb. So a suicide or uh, what's referred to as a V-bed. The last area is, was really my focus, and that's radio-controlled uh, uh, IED. In other words, someone's pressing a button on some device or sending some sort of signal through our uh, radio fre frequency signal to another device, and that is actually setting off the IED. Radio controlled initiators, the most common, the one you press the key fob that you open your car with, very popular use uh, for IEDs early on in Iraq. Not a lot of distance on that thing though. When they realize they had to stand 50 feet or less from the road and they know you're looking for them, maybe they want a little bit more distance. Motorola, walk about, talk about radios, FRS, all over the place. Long-range cordless telephones, not very prevalent in the United States because of power restrictions set by the FCC. Very similar to the cordless telephone you have in your house, but imagine if you could, imagine if it was good for 20, 30, or 40 kilometers. They're all over Iraq and, uh, and Europe. Imagine taking your home phone and, when you went to work, driving around, the, wherever. Lastly, the cellular telephone. Cell, we talked about the rapid growth of cellular networks in Iraq. Well, there's cell coverage almost everywhere people are. That means you can detonate an uh, IED anywhere people are. What's the second uh, portion of an IED? Well, it's the detonator. It's the thing that receives the charge from the initiator and sets off the explosive device. What's a detonator? Well, it's a blasting cap. It's a... Um, debt cord, it's some sort of device that sets off the explosive charge. And the third portion of the IED is the explosive charge. This is the thing that goes boom. There are lots of this stuff all over the place. So back in 2003, what was everybody talking about? WMDs, 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 weapons of mass destruction, biological, nuclear, you, you've heard all that stuff. That was the focus. That's what we were looking for. 
What weren't we looking for? The tons and tons and tons and tons and tons times infinity of conventional weapons all over the place in Iraq. Artillery shells, mortar shells, landmines, unexploded ordnance that we dropped and didn't go off. All of this stuff is all over Iraq. We found some of it. We found perhaps a lot of it, but there's still a lot of it left. Not much of a focus on this stuff. So now we know the three basic components to the IED. You have the initiator, uh, the detonator, and the explosive charge. So it could be more complicated than that, of course, and probably most of them are, but those are the basic components. So let's talk now about attacking the IED problem. And if you think about this, it's like I said earlier, it's like risk. You can't eliminate risk. You can only manage it. I'm a penetration tester, by the way. I'm a penetration tester of enemy air defenses. <laughs> Think about that one. My high-speed anti-radiation missile is, is your metasploit. At least a few people laughed. Attacking the IED problem. There are five steps to attacking the IED problem. This was outlined in a press conference by the DOD. So it's not like, wow, this is really, I mean, this is cool information to me, and it, hopefully it's cool to you. But it's not, like, it's not like I assembled this and, wow, you revealed some classified information. The first step is to eliminate source materials. We just talked about the source materials. The uh, radio-controlled devices, the initiators, the detonators. All three of those things are source materials. So. Initiators, the first step of source materials. Well, of course, all this stuff is dual-use technology. You've all heard of dual-use technology. It's a technology that can be used perhaps in a good way or a bad way. A cell phone. This thing could be used to detonate an IED in Iraq, or it could be used for me to talk to my wife. It's a dual-use technology. So we're not going to stop people from using cell phones in Iraq because we just installed their cell phone network. Well, not we, but... So many of these devices are designed for non-military purposes. So we can't just ban them. We can't really control them either. The problem is they're being exploited as devices for IEDs. There's a plentiful, plentiful supply. Do you really have any doubt that, that cell phones won't get to Iraq or Motorola radios won't get to Iraq? Virtually impossible to track. And they're required for basic government functions. Remember, those three out of every 100 people that have landline telephones in Iraq, that includes the people that work for the government, too. So they have cell phones. The government operates on cell phones. You can't just eliminate them. We've already talked about this. A landline network is virtually non-existent, extremely costly to rebuild. Lots of people. Here's the map again. Why did I show that twice? Detonators, the second source material. Detonators are also do-use technology. What are we talking about doing in Iraq? Rebuilding, 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 rebuilding. How do you rebuild? Well, sometimes you've got to blow stuff up to rebuild it. You know, it's part of the construction process. Detonators are a legitimate uh, use, have legitimate uses in construction. Of course, they're being exploited for IEDs. Again, plentiful supply, almost impossible to track. Finally, the explosive charges. Huge caches left over from Iran-Iraq War, the Gulf War, 2003 Iraq War, all, everything, all over the place. And when I say all over the place, really, there are huge bunkers, underground bunkers, everywhere filled with stuff. It's, and it's not even sometimes that we can't, that we don't know where this stuff is. We don't have the resources to go get it all. It's everywhere. Again, the focus was on major conventional weapons, SCUD missiles, WMDs, all that sort of stuff, and the conventional ordnance was kind of left over. Okay, so we talk about trying to eliminate the source materials, and we see that that really is a very difficult, if not almost impossible problem. So what's the next step? Well, let's, let's target the IED network. So perhaps we can locate and eliminate the financial backers behind the network 
or locate and try to eliminate the, the actual people. Try to like round up the people that are actually building these things. You can see that uh, JIADO stands for Joint IED Def Defeat Organization. There's your next acronym. Their budget for offensive operations, which they really won't say what that means. I can't tell you what it means. Grew from 13% of their budget to 31% of their budget. So a considerable increase in their budget went to offensive operations. In other words, going after something. This nice little graph over here shows you the number of tips that are called in to the, to the coalition forces. Because when, when, they, when people call in and they give tips, and if, perhaps if it's a good tip and someone's rounded up, then you, know, you slip them a few hundred dollars, they might call again. So how do we eliminate the network? Well, there's an organization called SEXI. This is really what, how they pronounce it, SEXI. Combined Explosives Exploitation Cell. There's your next acronym. What does that mean? Well, it means Coalition IED Forensic Investigation and Hardware Hacking Group. That's basically what they do. I can't really go into more detail. They, they, they really have a sign on their door that says CSI Baghdad. And I, and I, I say that half jokingly and half serious, that that's really what they do. They're, they're, CSI, they're CSI Baghdad. They really are. You, if you want to find more about sexy search from the Google, you won't find all that much. Here's one thing I did find. They provide the technical and operational analysis of bombs. So basically what I said, they, they try to figure out how the devices operate. They're interact, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the front line of, of the CSI part. The back part is called, uh, a net, it's, it's a program called TDAC. Uh, t uh, terrorist Explosive Device Analytical Centers. So this is a big database that's run by the FBI and uh, ATF. So all this stuff that they, they kind of get in Iraq and Afghanistan and all over the place. They send it back to the states and they have these huge databases so that you know, maybe you can perhaps fingerprint who's doing a certain bomb or something like that. There's a couple links down there. That's about all the only thing on the internet about TDAC, really. That's, I mean, you can go, they have like a website, but there's really nothing else. That's about all you can find. They are .gov sites too, so. So we do have a little bit of a, a capability in, in eliminating the network by, by seeing how their devices operate and seeing how, um, seeing, I mean, it's, it's almost like, a, you know, if you're doing a, a analysis of crimes and, and somebody has the same, the same description of the same person is doing a certain crime. We have a, a series of robberies going on back in State College, Pennsylvania, and it's all the robberies are white male, 5'6 five, five, to 5'9, five, 170 pounds, wears black, brandishes a black. I mean, the description's pretty much the same in all of them. And so you can almost do that sort of thing in, with a, a bomb. You can take a look at a bomb and almost tell who makes it. You may be able to say, all these bombs were made by this guy. Maybe. So we do have a bit of a capability there. Third step is eliminate the bomb and placer. This is the guy who actually goes out, takes the bomb, puts it on the road, maybe digs a hole or you know, whatever he wants to do. He so he emplaces the IED at the target location. He may or may not be part of the network. He may be um, he may be part of the group, and his job is to put them out there. Or they may, you know, come into your house, point a gun at your head, and say, "You will go put this out on the road, and here's twenty dollars or fifty dollars, and thank you very much for your help." So he may or may not be sympathetic to uh, the insurgents. He may, they may be people who are sympathetic to the, to the uh, coalition forces. You can't really say, but perhaps we can eliminate the person who's actually placing the bomb there. Right, let me go back. This person may or may not actually arm the device. They may have someone else come about, some by later and arm the device. So one guy puts it out there, another guy comes and arms it. They may be involved in videotaping the operation. Most of the IED videos you see on the internet where they play the Haji music is, is actually, uh, or, or filmed by the insurgents. They love videotaping. There's al almost always somebody videotaping. So how do you eliminate the bomb and placers? Well, we get, you get tips, community pressure, and money. If, you know, if they pay $50 for them to emplace it, then we'll pay them $100 not to emplace it. 
you know, sometimes the money talks. So, let's say we've gotten to this point and we were, uh, we've been unsuccessful in eliminating the source materials. We can't figure out who's behind the bomb and we can't figure out how to stop the guy from placing the bomb. So the bomb's out there. Our next step is to prevent detonation. So we want to stop this ID, IED from going off. This was my primary job in Iraq. Electronic warfare, jamming, IEDs, try to prevent them from going off. There's that statement again that somebody got like a, a really good award for writing that. I saw. Jammers, RF energy, you know how, j this is how jamming works. There's a receiver that's being jammed. There's two people jamming it, the guy trying to set off the bomb and me. Jamming works by who gets more power into the receiver. So if I can get more power into the receiver, the device doesn't go off. Very simple. How do you pr get more power? How do you get more power into the receiver? Well, perhaps you have more power or you're closer. Those are the two primary things. There's lots of jammers, airborne, vehicle mounted, dismounted. Different models, different manufacturers, different capabilities. That's all I have to say about that. I can't go into any more detail. Honestly, um, I don't want to. And that's because if I reveal capabilities of the, of the, uh, that we have, then they can adapt their tactics to perhaps harm people that I know who are still in Iraq right now. So I'm not going to tell you. I hope you can appreciate that too. Okay, so we haven't been able to eliminate the source. We haven't been able to eliminate the network. We haven't been able to eliminate the bomb being in place and we couldn't prevent it from going off. So this IED is going to go off. The last step, protection against explosion. How can we protect our soldiers, not just the United States, but there's, you know, you, you hear mostly the United States, yes, but there are quite a few countries who have soldiers in Iraq who are putting their country's soldiers, or putting their soldiers in harm's way every day. Armor protection. It's not just about more. The easy answer is, well, let's just put more armor on the Humvee. Well, there's a couple problems with that. First of all, there's a couple different types of armor. There's one type of armor called high hard steel. There's another type of armor called rolled homogeneous armor. The problems with these things are is that one armor may be good against stopping bullets, okay? but perhaps doesn't do so well against expl uh, explosions. The other type of armor is quite the opposite. It does well against explosions, but doesn't do so well against bullets. So we can't just put more armor on. This is a short little video, and this just shows you effect of, of something called spalling. Spalling is where armor is hit by a projectile and actually breaks off part of the armor, uh, not only going through the armor, but causing the armor to actually fracture and sending more shards of armor into the vehicle. Spalling very dangerous and very casualty causing in Iraq. So really, you have to find, it's not just about more armor, it's about finding the right type of armor, the right combination of types of armor. Also consider this, and this is, to me, the, when, you, when, you, when I read this slide, you're going to say this stuff's obvious, but we don't always think about it. More armor means more weight, a lot of weight. You're taking a 14,000 pound or 13,000 pound Humvee and adding perhaps a thousand more pounds to it. What does this do? It decreases the maneuverability and speed of the vehicle. It increases the rollover potential because it raises the center of gravity. The private or the sergeant who's been driving this vehicle for six months knows the every inch of that vehicle. He knows exactly how to drive it. You've just changed the center of gravity of his vehicle. You've just decreased the responsiveness of his gas pedal. You've put more of a strain on his engine and his transmission. 
you've added more stuff and now his vehicle is stretched to the limit he may roll this vehicle over the first time he takes it out because he doesn't understand that that thousand pounds did all that to his armor so it's not just about adding more the second part the second point about uh, protection against explosion is the underbody versus the sides of the vehicle as in, as in every mythical sense, the underbody of a vehicle is always the most vulnerable portion, and it's often the most or the least protected portion of the vehicle. It's great to have stuff on the sides, but what happens when that when that uh, IED blows up right underneath the tire or right underneath the engine block? You'll see really in the next year that the U.S. military is going to. V-shaped hulls. When we say V-shaped, like literally, looks kind of looks like the bottom of a boat. And the idea of this is, instead of the explosion going up into the vehicle, to direct it outward, to protect, basically giving a better um, underbody protection to soldiers. This is this will probably be uh, the biggest lifesaver of troops in Iraq. The last thing I want to talk about is a little bit about the future, and these are some things that are sometimes somewhat being implemented in Iraq, some not being implemented in Iraq, kind of a hodgepodge of things that I found that may or may not help our problem. The first is a very interesting project being done at the University of Missouri Rolla that has no connection with the military. This was in, uh, in their automotive engineering department. They uh, started a project where they wanted to listen to a car engine and determine uh, what, t uh, by listening to the engine, kind of make a signature and be able to say, well, that's a Chevrolet uh, 19, uh, you know, actually a sig make a signature of the vehicle. And for f they, somewhere, somehow they went from that to being able to look at a, a, a device, an electronic device that is perhaps not even on or radiating, but still gives off, gives off unintended emissions. So perhaps a RC, RC toy uh, car or controller that is turned off. It's still giving off some emissions. They're unintended because the circuit is not perfect, but it's still giving off some sort of emissions. This project is able to um, look at those emissions and actually determine what sort of device that is. So a device that's not even on, they can look at, it at just a receiver, look at the unintended emissions of the receiver and say, well, that's an RC toy controller. That's, I mean, this is a really cool project that hopefully will get picked up by the military and implemented uh, into uh, detection of IEDs. Because if it's an explosive device and it's got some sort of circuit, it's going to give off some sort of emissions. The second is uh, a project to um, kind of hit, uh, talk about the problem where we said adding lots of weight to the vehicle. And this is an idea about putting like an explosive resistant coating, almost like, uh, um, what's that stuff that you spray in the back of your truck, like a, a truck liner type, uh, not, not exactly that, but some kind of spray on material, something that would provide some, some explosive protection. And there's some testing going on in this. I mean, they're not saying, yes, this will work, but you know, they're trying to, what can we add to the vehicle that doesn't weigh a lot, that does provide some sort of protection? The last idea is something that uh, is very kind of interesting, and the idea is instead of uh, uh, someone you know calling on a cell phone and and calling a you know coalition hotline and saying the Al Qaeda is in my neighborhood, uh, I'd like you to come and get them, you know because perhaps Al Qaeda will visit his house and look at his cell phone and know that he called. The, the idea is to have some sort of uh, almost like. Uh, tour over cell phones where uh, you know someone can call you know dial and send a text message to some random number and and then this message will somehow get to the coalition or you know and it's not just cell phones they, any sort of sensors that are out there that can transmit information I mean this is more this idea is more um, theoretical than really imp implementation or in, in any sort of implementation phase but it's you know it's an idea that's out there it's how can we get people to provide information or to inform on the coalition or to inform on insurgents but still having some protection from their self because who's going to inform when they know that someone may be coming to their house uh, that night to visit them and not be friendly 
Hyperspectral sensors. Hyperspectral sensors are, um, so we're talking about a sensor that uh, detects uh, emissions over a wide range of the, of the spectrum and can detect, detect changes in the spectrum. So you've seen those videos or those infrared videos or where they show a street of cars and you can say, oh, that car is just turned off because the engine block's still glowing. The heat from the engine block is still glowing because it's detecting a change in the temperature. So perhaps if we uh, scanned an area of the ground and then we uh, perhaps there was a hole dug, a, a hole dug, uh, a hole dug in the ground recently somewhere. Well, you think we could probably tell that the temperature of the ground there would be different from the surrounding area because it had been disturbed. So that's another area where we can perhaps say where something has been changed. Go to this last thing. The last thing I want to talk about is, is a specific kind of IED. It's called an EFP, or an Explosively Formed Penetrator. This is a very dangerous device. This is a shaped charge. The picture on the left is a EFP. That thing is probably the size of a large coffee can. Okay? It's a cylinder, and that's got a copper concave lid on it. And you can see the picture kind of on the sideways there. This explosive device is designed to go off, and that concave copper lid will actually invert, as you can see in the uh, uh, picture there. It's a scientific effect called the Misne Chardon effect. It'll actually turn into a molten jet that will eat through just about any armor out there. This is a recovered uh, piece of an EFP. After it, obviously, it's not molten anymore. But this thing will go through almost anything. I, res I was uh, responded to a incident where one of our vehicles was hit by one of these devices. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured. However, there were holes all over the place in the armor where this stuff just penetrated right in, cut through steel like butter. These things are not new. The Israelis have been dealing with them for decades. And if you know, if you can figure out who the enemies of the Israelis are, not just, not just people in Israel, but larger, you can, see, you can imagine perhaps where they come from. They're, they don't all come from Iraq. There's some people that are very good at these things. They've been doing them for a long time. I'll leave a few minutes for questions here, and then I will go over. There's a room down the main hallway. I think it's 110 or one of those rooms in the main hallway. It says um, Area 1 Q&A. If you have any questions at all, please come down to that room. I will be more than happy to stay there as long as, as, until they kick me out to answer your questions. There's a couple of people I'd like to thank. The DEF CON staff, especially because I hope that in the last 45 minutes or so, you, you think, well, wow, that's, that's kind of a talk that I didn't expect at DEF CON. This is not the thing that you would expect to come to a computer convention and see. However, I think it's something that would be interesting to you. Have you guys found this interesting? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm part of an organization called the Church of Wi-Fi. Uh, we're running the Wireless Village up in Skybox 209. I've seen a lot of you up there. The, tr the room has been packed all weekend. And because of that, it's, we're likely to have the same opportunity at DEF CON next year. We're going to be operating tomorrow, probably from 11 or so until the closing ceremonies. So please, stop by the Wireless Village. We'll have uh, an RFID locating contest tomorrow and a breakout session. So if you don't even know anything about RFID, and you want to learn. Uh, our, one of our members, Thorne, who's up here in the front, will be giving that session tomorrow. We even have some of the materials you need, so you can show up with nothing and when you can make something. It'll be really cool. My family, my wife is back uh, in Pennsylvania. I've got a seven and a half month old who my wife is sending me pictures of the other, uh, last night uh, running around in her walker. And so my wife is at home taking care of the kids and allowing me to be here. 
I talked about the Wireless Village and the contest. Thank you all for coming to the talk. Like I said, this is my first DEF CON too. DEF CON is what you make of it. So hopefully some of you, if you have ideas, get up here and talk. I mean, this is my first DEF CON. I didn't expect to be sitting in area one, the biggest room in all of DEF CON, practically full. I mean, for, thank you. It's, it's at 8 o'clock. I figured there, it's not going to be completely full, but this is really cool. Question. Oh, it's, it, the question is, it's not all, are you saying, are all the cell phones Motorola? I said Motorola five times. <laughs> Did I really say Motorola five times? Did I really say Motorola five times? There's cell phones. Um, all the cell phones are the, all sorts of cell phones. But I have seen a lot of the talk. I was just talking about the, the Motorola talk about. But yes, cell phones of all varieties, Siemens, uh, Nokia, um, whatever your cell phone is, there's one of them in Iraq, too. You're welcome. <laughs> Question up here in the front. Yes. Yes. It could be possible, but now you're assuming that the cell phone company has advanced knowledge that a call is going to be made in it with all calls. Okay, the question was, can, can the cell phone company introduce some sort of delay into the network to, in, to perhaps make the call perhaps just a little bit more inconvenient, but uh, pr reduce the pr uh, probability of the cell phone detonating the ID at the right time? Is, was that correct? Um, it's already, I, can't, I won't go into specifics. Detonating a cell phone IED at a precise time is already very difficult. So um, I don't know if that's possible. Uh, it, I, honestly, I don't know if that's possible. The, the, because we've handed over sovereignty of the country to Iraq, it's, it's their country. We can kind of make suggestions to them, but it's up to them whether or not they follow them. Yes, right here. Um, the question was, is the device linked to a particular cell phone or any random cell phone? Generally, they're going to call a specific cell phone and perhaps have some sort of code to set it off. Does that make sense? So yes, they're going to a specific phone. Does that answer your question? There, yeah, there may, be, there may be a cell phone to a cell phone or a landline to a cell phone. The cell phone may actually be the initiator and the receiver of the signal as well. Second row right here. Sure. I would say that, that in large part that, I won't say that it's discouraged, but uh, the, rank the, the rank structure in place is such that my job was not to come up with ideas. Okay? So if, if I had an idea, whether it was good or not, it didn't really matter because that was not, that was not my job. So in that sense, um, the military or the concept of what I was doing was very anti-hacker in that sense. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Because I did submit a couple ideas and they were, didn't go very far and I thought they were good ideas, but it was, that was not my job in Iraq, so do your job. 
His question, I'm sorry, I, I didn't repeat it. His question was, is the military structure geared so that people can uh, submit ideas and ver be oh, very open and kind of be outside of the, and that's, uh, there's not that kind of uh, environment. Sorry, the light's a little bright. The second row over here. In general, um, his question is, uh, are we seeing more advanced uh, techniques, detonators, devices from the enemy? Warfare is, is back and forth. It's always we do something, they respond, or they do something, we respond to it. Um, they do something else, we respond to that. That's the history of warfare, and it's no different in Iraq. It started out with very simple devices, and it's gotten more complicated as it's gone on. So yes, you're, you're correct in assuming that. Any other questions? Like I said, if you have other questions that you haven't asked here, I will go to, I'm not sure what room it is. It's the first room on the left in the main hallway when you go towards the registration desk. I'll be there until they kick me out. Thank you for coming tonight. Enjoy the rest of your DEF CON.